Hi everybody, this is Manuel Amonategui, and today I'm going to talk about uh, handling large text factors, basically modeling uh, data sets containing uh, large text factors. Uh, for starters, um, I'm using my uh, walkthrough to go through this uh, video, uh, to guide me through the video, so please go to it. There, All the code is there, and um, also a lot of links uh, throughout. Um, so that we're all on the same page, when I'm talking about a large text factor, imagine a data set with 10 million rows. And imagine um, that one of the features, one of the columns in this data set is a text factor. Now, text factors are not all equal, of course. If you have a text factor that has three levels, happy, sad, and neutral, then that's not a big deal, right? You would simply dumbify your, uh, that, those fact, that factor into three separate columns one column for happy, one for sad, and one for neutral, or even just two, because a third is redundant, right? So um, that's easy to do. Uh, what happens if you have, um, you know, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you also have free text. So this is not really a factor. It's really like essays. And there is nothing more than you can do but, you know, enter the realms of natural language processing. And that's a whole other ballgame. So if it's a text factor, you have a million levels in that factor, then you know, you can't uh, make a million extra rows. You can't dumbify all of that because it would explode your feature space. So that's not a, that's not a, an option. The the one option would be to translate those levels into uh, uh, numerical values, basically encode them, and then use it in a, a classification model. It wouldn't work in a li in a regression model because uh, you know if one entry is you know I am happy and the next entry is I have lost my keys. Then the regression model might, might say, oh, you know, your value is not 1 or 2, it's 1.5. That doesn't really mean anything, because there's nothing in between, you know, I am happy and I lost my keys. So encoding them w could work with a classification model. But here, if you have uh, 10,000 um, uh, levels, it's hard to do by hand, and it's also a shame to lose some of the, the intelligence, some of the essence inside that text. So there are tools that can help us. The tool that we're going to look at today is called String Dist, basically String Distance. The String Distance package uh, in R accepts a lot of different algorithms. The two I like are the Jarrow Winkler, and it looks at the similarity between two strings, and the other one is the Levenstein Distance, and that looks at the minimum number of single character edits. So I have links for those interested. And there's also a lot more algorithms that may suit your needs better. But these two work fairly well with short text, basically small sentences. So let's go to, uh, let's look at some code. That's probably the best way to start. Let me just clean this up here. There. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, um, you know, download a data set that suits uh, our needs. We're going to go to uh, download a Hadley Wickham data set. He's the, uh, the author of ggplot2, uh, amongst other things. And he has uh, um, uploaded a series of data sets that are uh, more complex than what you'd normally see, kind of more real-world data. So we're going to use the R curl to get that data and to assign it to vehicles. And now let's look at what we just downloaded. So uh, it has 34,000 uh, observations or rows. And we're going to specifically look at one factor uh, feature in this data set called model. So that where you know uh, the vehicles data set contains basically a lot of metrics, you know, uh, consumption of a vehicle, the type of vehicle, type of engine, etc. And we're only interested in model. So let's take. Um, and a good way to start always is to to kind of take a subset, a very small subset of that data, to kind of see how string distance works. So we're going to make a smaller subset of that of our vehicles data set called vehicle small and only has a hundred rows and let's see how many unique models how many unique levels of the model feature we have 45 and let's take a peek at a few of them so basically it's, it's kind of an explanation of the vehicle so here you have the spider veloc 2000 testa rosa uh, you know b150 slash b250 wagon two-wheel drive legacy etc so it kind of these are short text entries and in this data set of 100 observation, we have 45 unique. So we're going to call the string distance library. Let me go back to the walkthrough and just show you something else really quickly. 
Okay, here is the string distance matrix, string dist matrix function that we just called, and it takes um, the unique variables. Uh, it can do more, as you can see, but we're just going to use it in a simple way. It takes the unique, all the unique, a vector of all the unique levels uh, in our uh, in our factor, and the method with which you want to calculate the string distance, and it has a slew of them. Again, we're only going to look at uh, the JW, Jarrow Wrinkler. So let's go back to our code. Okay, so now we create a unique string, uh, un sorry, unique vector of all our models, and then we're going to call the string dist matrix. We pass it our unique models, and we select the model we want, Jarrow Winkler, and here I'm calling it. And this is really just an algorithm of, uh, uh, you know, the string distance between all these unique variables we just passed to it. it it's actually, the clustering is going to be done by hclust, which is a, a hierarchical clustering function in R. Again, links uh, in the walkthrough. And we're also going to pass it uh, the row names, because this will return just numbers. It's going to tell cluster number one, cluster number two, and that's not going to help us. We actually want to see where what are the names, right? And hclust is actually going to cut up our data. And we're going to visualize it. Because we have so few of them, we can visualize it in a dendrogram. So let me just make some more space here and call. And we're going to say, out of those 45 unique models, I want 20 groups. Make it a little bit bigger here. So it's created 20 groups from the, the, the 45 different uh, models. So for example, the easy ones, I don't know if you can see this, but the two-wheel drive wagons it's put into one group. Um, what's another obvious one? Uh, it looks like the series of BMWs, 750, 740, 740, were all put in one group. Two similar looking numbers in one group, etc. So this is not very impressive so far, how it's grouped it, because there's so few of them, and it would be trivial to, to come up with better groups than what it did for us, right? So now we're going to kind of kick it up a notch, and we're going to get 2,000 vehicles instead of... Uh, 100 like we did earlier and let's see how many unique models we have in this new data set we have 481 unique models in these 2000 observations so we're going to do what we did before except we're not going to attempt to visualize it because uh, it'd be very hard to see once you have too many vehicles it's impossible to see but we have other ways of doing it so we're going to do the same thing as we did before we're going to create a unique uh, a vector of unique models we're going to pass it to our string disk matrix function, again, same method as before, Jarrow Winkler. We're going to pass back the row names so we're not stuck with the numbers. And then we're going to cluster it. And now we have it clustered, we're going to say, give, make a data frame of the unique models and give me um, uh, 200 groups. So remember we had 480 models, 81 models, and we only want to see them into 200 groups. So we run this code. We're just going to rename the, the headers, the column headers, to make it easier. And one way of visualizing what it did is to plot the table of the clusters. So here, you see it has given us, uh, we asked for 200 groups. So here are the 200 groups. And you see that it assigned one group actually has 10 models, 11 models. And most of them have, you know, between two and one model in each group. So let's see what it did. And that's kind of the approach you should use, you know. Um, once you have created your, your groupings, go through the groupings manually. Because, you know, if you have, let's say, 10 million entries, 10 mil million unique levels, and you ask them, you know, give me 50 groups, then you can quickly go through the groups and see which ones are good, which ones are not good. Keep the good ones and throw out the bad ones, right? Um, okay, so we did that. And it tells you that the average number of models per cluster is 2.4, so which makes sense, right? And now, now this code is a little bit complicated code, but don't sweat it. We just want to look at um, uh, the type of groups. So we're basically going to use a table function on the cluster, the cluster was created, and kind of do some ordering and uh, just to get the top clusters. 
So I'm just going to run all this. Actually, let's clean it up. Let's do it again. There. So we just got the top uh, clusters for our um, uh, for our 200 groups. So the first group, as you remember, we had one group that had 11 models, and it's cluster 73. If you count them, there are exactly 11 models in this group. And let's see what it did. Obviously, it looked at the word pickup. So a variable with numbers followed by pickup and followed by either four-wheel drive or two-wheel drive, right? So that's the first group it did. It's not bad, right? Second group is group is cluster 123. It looked at chassis, cab, chassis, two-wheel drive, and it's pretty cool that it even picked up the one with a slash in between and grouped it. Um, you know, suburbans, uh, that's, that's an interesting grouping here too. The convertible, that's an easy one to understand, right? It took all the word convertible in it. And, you know, the vag wagons, etc. So, see, so this is one easy way of getting groupings uh, from large uh, factor, uh, text factors. And you can also, um, uh, you know, uh, change your, your grouping size and you'll get different types of, of groups. So you got to find the right grouping for, for the, the type of data you have. You know, if you think, you know, you have, you know, uh, you know, 100 groups and definitely go for, uh, you know, a cluster of, a, of, of 100. So that's one thing that I wanted to show. But why, you know, why limit yourself just to, you know, clustering that one factor level? How about combining two factors together? So we have, there's two fields here. There's a, um, the, the, you know, this is what we were playing with earlier. Let's just look at this, okay? The model name, but we also have, for example, another one called Tranny, which has the transmission information, whether five speed, manual, five speed, you know, automatic three speed, etc. So what we're gonna do now is combine, create a new feature with the model and a tranny together. Again, we're dealing with a data set of, um, you know, 2000 observations. Let's check that. Um, 2000 observation. And we created this new uh, feature. And the new feature has 808 unique variables. So we made it, we made it less, uh, uh, you know, granular. We, we bought more, more, more data together. So in this, in this way, it doesn't make sense, except when you start grouping it. Because by combining these two factors together, it's going to find different types of groups that it wouldn't find, obviously would not find on the, uh, on the factors on their own. So let's look. We're going to, this time we're going to, I'm going to run the exact same code as we did before. I'm just going to run one go. Except we're going to ask for 500 groups instead, instead of 200. And we're going to look at what, what it, the groups it came up with. So the first cluster, it pulled a series of numbers with automatic four speed. Then, for example, wagon automatic four speed pulled them together. What else is interesting here? The rams pickup and five speeds pull all of those together, etc., etc., etc. So you see that you can combine these things. You can change the grouping size, and you will get com a completely different variable. And once you, if you restrict your group size to something small, then you're going to easily uh, be able to dummify them, basically put them into separate columns. So if you say, give me 100 groups, then you can easily add an extra, uh, uh, you know, an extra 100 features, 100 columns to your data set. That's not going to, you know, blow up your feature space. Um, there's a few notes I had as a conclusion in the walkthrough. Let me just go there. Um, it is, uh, um, it is case sensitive. So if your data is, um, has, you know, upper and lower case and it doesn't need to be, then I would put everything in either lower or upper case and you would get, you know, uh, better groups. If it is case sensitive, then I would leave it that way because it will catch, it will capture that. It will consider that, you know, different groups. All the code is here, um, in, in the walkthrough and the, the link should be up on your, uh, on your screen. I hope you found this helpful. It certainly has helped me. Uh, you know, gain more uh, uh, substance out of my factor levels. And um, uh, I hope you find that interesting and useful to your project as well. Thank you.